Welcome, welcome to Dev Days, everyone. I know folks, a few folks arrived yesterday, but this is the first like real kickoff of, uh, we'll get into some meteor sessions today. Not that yesterday's weren't meteor, but we tend to go deeper on uh, kind of day two here. Um, so I'm Brett Marquard, uh, principal at One Associates. Uh, my background is in the EHR kind of development space. Uh, I grew up doing version two in CD interfaces and somehow stumbled into standards. And it's a place I'd like to invite all of you at the end. Uh, the standards are only as good as the input we get. And so uh, we need everyone's input. But I'm also a Minnesotan. Uh, and so it's really great to have folks here. Uh, I'm, I, has anybody heard kind of a, any Minnesota phrases out there? Anything they've picked up on around here? Or go ahead. Minnesota nice. Minnesota nice. I heard it. I heard you. Are you betcha? You got. Bubblers. What's that? Bubblers. Yeah, that's a mix. That's a mixed Minnesota. Minnesota Wisconsin one, but I'll take. I'll take it. Um, one of the things I joke. So I actually left for 20 years to Massachusetts, and and I came back. And so it's it's funny how you know you change. One of the things I noticed is like, we say sorry a lot. Okay. So if you bump into someone, don't say excuse me. You say oops, sorry. Okay. And and I laugh. I, I even the. The person moderating this room was kind enough to help me set up and actually bump something. And instead of saying, excuse me, or oh, let me fix that, he has adjusted the culture and said, oops, sorry, and so it made me smile on the setup. You got you betcha. It's a simple yes or you bet in my family. We don't say you betcha. Um, and then the last one, which is a, you, you got to watch voice inflection here, folks. If you say that's interesting, you can kind of say, oh, that, that's interesting. Or you can say, oh, that's, that's interesting. It can mean like, um, it can mean like a really bad thing, like, oh, gosh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so when you, when you give someone a compliment on their talk, be careful on the use of interesting to Minnesota, because they're Minnesotan, because they're trying to think, like, are they thinking like they actually liked my talk? Or are they saying my talk made no sense? So try to avoid, you know, they, it's just a word we use sometimes. All right, so anyway, enough of Minnesota. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. The weather will get nicer later today and tomorrow, and it's going to be a good week. Um, all right, so back to US Core, why you're here. Uh, standards are developed by teams of people, and any of us who gets to speak are, we're, we're the lucky, or I don't know, lucky or unlucky ones that have to. Um, but the US core team uh, is Gay Dolan, a nurse informaticist uh, who t provides our terminology support. Uh, that's definitely not an area of my expertise. And Eric Haas, who is the uh, world's best IG editor, makes it readable, and just a great team to work with. Um, and in the band, okay. Anybody who's commented on the spec, we've gotten thousands of comments over the years. That's what makes it good. Uh, we, we think it's good because it gets better every year. You know, it's not, it's not something that we're, we're set on a certain format, but we're trying to improve it every year. So anyway, let's get going. So objectives, you're going to walk out of here and know the relationship with US CDI and US Core. Uh, you're going to recognize the importance of profiles while we have them. We'll do a little, little bit of US Core spec navigation uh, so that you feel comfortable opening it up after the talk. A little bit of testing, and then talk about kind of future uh, future design work. Okay, so up front, so US Core, or sorry, US CDI uh, is a standardized set of health data classes and data elements for nationwide interoperable health information exchange. This is provided by in the US market, someone called the Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, they provide this on a yearly basis, and this is a screenshot of uh, the release four, which came out July of last year. Um, we have a little slightly, so this is, so this is, this is kind of the view from the government perspective. The view from kind of the industry perspective, I'll, I'll pretend I can give the industry perspective, is, is we view it as kind of data policy and that it's standards agnostic. It's just a set of data elements and they've started to add terminology. They used to not even include, uh, you know, to mention SNOMED or LOINC or ICD. It now actually has a, you know, when you see a medication, it'll say RxNorm. But that's as far as the ONC's USCDI goes. And so as a HL7 body, we take that and try to mash it into how it fits into FHIR. And I say HL7 is a mix of Argonaut and HL7 and others. Um, so it's, it's standards agnostic, it's use case agnostic, and the most important thing is it's the floor for standardization. All right, USCDI is not the end game. It doesn't cover everything. You know, there are things, missing elements for public health and quality and cancer. There's all kinds of additional things we want to add to it, but we want to make sure we're building on a stable foundation, so we're very careful, and we're thankful that uh, ONC is not making too big a leap. So one of the jokes I made with one of the policy folks at ONC is like, you can inflict a little bit of pain on us, but you know, do just the right amount. Don't, don't do too much, because you're going to lose our attention. And honestly, frankly, for those who are regulators from other countries, 
if you stretch too far, you can lose the market and people, I don't want to say they'll ignore you, but they won't give you the credit that you deserve in terms of trying to like bring people along to, for your priorities. So another point on being a standards agnostic, we implement USCDI in US Core. We also implement in a companion standard called CCDA. So for folks, we still do CDA documents in the US on the order of millions a day. Uh, and so that's, that's a good thing. And so we do today implement USCDI in both. So they're realized in both of those standards. Um, here's just a quick screenshot of the guide so you can see it. It's foundational guide that maps USCDI into FHIR. Um, I, you'll, you'll see this frog analogy throughout my presentations when I talk about this. I, I like to think we're both resting next to each other on a log right now. And the reason is we actually published US Core about five weeks ago. Okay, so US Core version 7 published the first week of May. US CDI, there's not a new release of US CDI till July. And so we have this like sweet moment, it's like early summer, we're like relaxing on a log together for once, okay? And next month, July, ONC is gonna like hop off with their new release and we're gonna like try to chase after them to try to update because we can't update at the same time because we don't know exactly what the policy folks are gonna drop on our lap and we have to respond to that. So we're always in this game of leapfrog but in a sweet moment in time, we're together. Um, so why does this matter? You know, like, it's great, you got the standard, Brett, who cares? Um, well, we do have some regulation behind it also. So the first kind of strong mention is in uh, the, Cur the Cures Act a few years back, named the release uh, US Core 310, and then an update uh, named 311. And then, of course, for folks who are tracking very, you know, I shouldn't say tracking very closely, we're all, uh, the, the most recent one is HTI1, I won't read the long name, but you'll see in there that they named uh, 6.1.0. And so for certified health IT in the US market, you're gonna see US Core 610 coming out. Uh, one vendor I spoke with yesterday, I'm always asking vendors, like, where are you at? How's the testing going? Where are you at? And uh, one had said, hey, this, this summer and fall release, we're, we're going to have US Core 610 capability. We're, we're going to have it available for our customers to start taking because 2025 is a big year for the market in that all those customers have to upgrade to 610 next year because the rule is on January 1st, 2026, your customers have access to 6.1.0. And that's a big deal, because that adds social terms to health. It adds a whole bunch of kind of new policy kind of objectives. And so for folks who are doing IG development, and you're always like, oh, we're using 3.1.1 or 3, look to 6.1.0, because that's where the market is going. If you're developing to 3.1.1 now, you're gonna miss the boat to get folks and get some of that new, uh, new functionality. And frankly, the guide reads so much better in 6. It's just like, there's so many good improvements to it. Okay, so bottom line, US Core enables US CDI. Um, and how does US Core do that? I, it's these moments of dev days being 10 years old, Argonauts turning 10 this year, there are all these things you reflect back in time and think, gosh, wh where have we come from? And I, you know, when I started working on fire, one of the things that was told to me, and it, it was you know, a 2013 uh, Lloyd McKenzie, brilliant, said, hey, we'll have profile this fire. You know, you don't need profiles. You look at the resources, so fire is built up of all these resources, and they're discreet enough. You'll exchange them, you populate what you know, and life will go on. Maybe, maybe we'll have profiles, but we can get by exchanging without them. And for folks who've dug in and followed the journey here, it's pretty clear we can't do profile this fire. So I'll put a big X on there. Um, and let me just give a really kind of quick run through here. Of like, oh, it's hard to see, but this is the condition resource in fire. So how to record problems, we call it a condition. And you'll see, you know, got an identifier, pretty important, clinical status, verification, category, severity, body site. This is a pretty extensive model. I'm sure some people would want more data elements, but this is a pretty rich model for capturing a condition. Does every EHR capture the stage of the condition? Is that important for every problem? Um, maybe, maybe not, or, but how tight is this model? And if you zoom way in, you'll see, okay, the code. So we're in condition code, and on the code, this tells you it identifies the condition problem or diagnosis. And there's kind of this big phrase here at the end that's a binding in FHIR called example. And so what this means is there's not a terminology tied to this condition. For, and for terminologists, your heads go, well, gosh, how would I ever know what this is without the right SNOMED or ICD concept to go in here? And so the base FHIR resource doesn't give guidance necessarily. And, and that's probably a good thing because an international standard we have different kind of requirements across different countries of how we do this. 
But to make Fire implementable, you got to give that the concrete guidance on what is the terminology we're going to all draw, to draw from so that we can exchange information. Um, and so if you ask core condition, uh, you'll see, we'll go back and forth here, this, this probably isn't a screenshot of everything, could collapse all the way down into a smaller set of elements. You know, we have kind of uh, clinical status, verification status, a category code in US Core, uh, if we need to support the ability to say whether it's a health concern or SDOH. And then if we zoom in on that condition.code, you'll see we actually have a value set there. And in that value set of US Core condition codes, if you were to launch into that, you would see that that's a value set of SNOMED and ICD-10 codes, because those are the accepted terms in the US for classifying problems. It does have this extensible binding, which is kind of interesting in that if if the value isn't included in that code system, you know, you can, you can, you know, if there's some new disease, you're able to use it, but the idea is that you're drawing from SNOMED and ICD, which are, are quite large systems. So profiles are important. It helps give concrete guidance uh, on how to implement uh, properly. Okay. So about the US Core Implementation Guide. Uh, it's built from this uh, original group, the Argonaut requirements. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Argonaut tomorrow, but Argonaut is an HL7 accelerator, which is kind of a mix of uh, private uh, vendors, uh, technology vendors, uh, client apps, actually a couple payers snuck in there um, that have helped to uh, make Fire deployable. Um, and so US Core is a formal standard for HL7, validated with a broad set of stakeholders. 6.1 is the one that supports US CDI version 3, uh, hundreds of trackers, um, and really the big piece is improved conformance and guidance sections. You may hear this phrase, must support, and for anybody who's written a guide, uh, there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth of what must support actually means, um, and I think it's finally stabilized into the 6.1.0 release. And, and really what must support means in, in a sentence, or I'll, I'll say it and someone can disagree with me after, is that the idea is we flag these elements with this little s in the profile, and it means your system has to support the ability to kind of capture and exchange that item, okay? That's part, you don't have to always have it, you're not gonna, because sometimes it's not available, but you at least have to have the capability to do that. Um, and in 7 at all, I can't help not mention it because it's just fresh off the presses, supports ONC's USCDI version four. We resolved another 130 trackers. Again, the detailed change logs there with uh, updated guidance. And then we added a new section on smart on fire obligations and capabilities. Um, so in terms of like fine granular controls of how to say, I want to give people access to uh, prop, like instead of um, uh, observation, like laboratory observations or vital sign observations. So the way instead of saying, you know, the smart kind of access by resource type, it's actually going to find a more fine grain uh, access spot. Okay, inside the spec, you'll find a US CDI uh, to US core profile mapping. Um, you'll see that the terminologies are built into the spec to align with the requirements of US core. We're, we're still kind of in this battle, uh, battle's a strong word, but you know, whether we embed terminology directly in the spec versus linking out to this thing called the Value Set Authority Center. And so if you read the spec, sometimes we link out to this, uh, it's provided by the National Library of Medicine, and that is a, a server that expands value sets, provides a kind of easy way for folks to download those systems. And part of the drive for VSAC in the past is it provides a shared source for the CCDA standard and US Core to, 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 to share. Um, we'll see how that evolves over time here. Okay, so a quick note on publication history. This is like a simple table for folks who want to know like, all right, which version maps with with? Here, you got it. Um, and one of the things I do think, if, if you are looking at US Core 311, we did do a fair bit of improvement and must support in 4.0. Uh, we didn't have the ability uh, in, you know, Graham is always changing the publisher. There's always new features in the publisher, okay? And in 311, we would put must support on like a value element, okay? And so for folks who know Fire under value, you can have like value quantity, value string, all these things underneath there. And so we would put the must support at that top level and say, all right, you know, pick one of these, good enough. Um, and certifiers came along and said, well, we can't certify to that. You gotta tell us like, we're gonna do all those data types under there. And the EHR said, well, we're not gonna do like sample data. Like there's some, there's some data types that people have not used. And so in 4.0, we actually started to apply that little S directly underneath the value elements, so you can see explicitly what, and I'll just show you, I don't wanna lose everyone here, so let's just like dive in here. Um, so we're gonna go like, we go to like observation, 
go like a laboratory result profile. And if you go in here, so I'm under value here. And you see before, in one of the prior releases, you see this like little red S. We didn't have the capability to put the S specifically on the uh, data types below. Um, and that came into existence in 4.0.0. And so we could be more explicit. Yes, we would love people to support all these. Um, but for laboratory results, um, you know, maybe not all these make sense or they're not as generally accepted. And so we want to at least call out, say, at least you're going to support these three. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, in terms of timelines of how this spec has run, um, you'll see that US Core is balloting every January. Um, I know it's a big, busy timeline, uh, but the current cycle we're in is the ONC is currently publishing a draft USCDI every January. They go through a comment period, and then they finalize it in the July of that year. And then we are basically nine months behind that, where we kick off a design cycle. Here. So we kick off our design cycle and come through here. We ballot. And then the idea is we publish the following year down here. That, that particular publication supports the prior year's uh, USCDI. We've kind of gone back and forth on how to do this. At some point, for, for folks who, you know, for this year and even last year, we started to actually do design on ONC's draft USCDI. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if, if you were looking back over time, ONC doesn't make a ton of changes between their draft USCDI and final. They make a small set of tweaks, like they may, you know, change the definition. Occasionally they remove something. Uh, more likely they add something. Um, and so we've just decided that it's not, it, it, it takes a bit of time to turn the kind of ONC, I'll call it the data, turn that data policy into a formal standard. Uh, it's not something that we can just do in a few months, uh, short time period. And I think part of the reason in the US market that that's the case is ONC gives us some nice flexibility in that. They define, they'll say, you know, medication root or medication, they'll give us a, you'll see different levels of granularity in terms of national, uh, so ours is the US core data for interoperability, there's Australian core data for interoperability, there's the Canadian has started one, so there's different ones around the world and, and at the government policy level we're starting to see folks go to a different level of detail and some at the national level go all the way down to the data type. I think in the US I, I feel fortunate and that our government is doing a nice job setting direction and then letting the market, like this may be a very US centric approach of like, let's let the market, let people fight it out a little bit. I think it's been a very healthy approach in the US market to figure help vendors actually be very honest about what they're planning to support and what is realistic for kind of the data policy that can be tested then. Okay, so a really short, I don't know, a couple of equations here. So US Core does not exactly equal US CDI. US CDI is that data policy and US Core we're not limited by what's in US CDI. So we have added things that are not in US. Uh, so US Core has added things that are not in US CDI. So for example, a few years back, encounter was not a thing. Well, how, how, how important are encounters in healthcare? Uh, pretty important. And, and part of it, it wasn't that ONC didn't think it was important, but the vendors had said, we already supported this. ONC hadn't caught up. So we just added it. And so if we have enough interest in the community of implementation experience, we can just add it to US Core because that's what HL7 and the Argonaut community decides they want to do. But we're at moments in time, the way I think of it is like, sometimes US Core is a little bit ahead of uh, ONC um, because we've added new things that aren't in US CDI. Sometimes US CDI gets a little bit ahead of US Core when there's a new rule or I don't know if they've, I'm really thankful right now because I feel like we're in this nice cycle of ONCs, you know, we expect them to post something in July, um, and it, it feels very good, but they can always change the rules, right? They're the regulators, and I sometimes joke regulators regulate, uh, and so you know, we'll, see, we'll see what's new. But right now we're in this nice pattern, and so we're in this continuous game of leapfrog to go back uh, to the frog analogy. Um, all right, so let's actually look a little bit at the spec here. Um, so in USCDI, you have this thing of patient demographics, and so the first thing we do is we're trying to figure out how to map uh, the ONC's policy to US Core patient. And just for kicks here, why don't we just like show what we're starting with here. And then pull us ahead of time. Uh, okay, so this is the ONC's US CDI page. I suspect many of you have seen this. Um, 
you can go across the tabs here to see the various uh, versions. Um, and ONC does a nice job adding, uh, kind of growing the spec. They're very, there's only one or two times where I've, they've you know, changed the definition of an element, which I think they've learned that that is a, a bad thing to do. Um, but you can see draft v5. Another thing that ONC has done uh, with industry input, which has been, I think, also a very healthy thing, is you can see forecasts of where things are going with levels 0, 1, and 2. And so you can see, like, these are elements that ONC is considering adding or, or has been, folks have submitted to them to add in the future. Uh, and then they have a pathway of saying, hey, to graduate to level 1, you need to meet these criteria. To graduate to level two, you need to meet this criteria. So the idea that there's some industry feedback to help you know, grow it before it gets into like a formal policy of USCDI. So if you have data elements you'd like to add or have ONC considered, don't hesitate to submit those uh, to ONC. Um, but don't let that stop you. You can go test things on your own. Okay, so the inside here, you'll see for patient, they have a set of demographics here. So last name, first name, middle name. So these are the set of things that ONC, I think actually goes up to the top continued. These are the set of things that uh, are considered policy uh, directives for the standard itself. And so what we have to do is look at the spec or look at what's available in, uh, in FHIR and say, all right, maybe we'll make some adjustments. So we decide which elements we need to support. Um, I, I know it's hard to see in the back probably, but that's the patient dot identifier. Um, you know, patient's medical record number. We have lots of identifiers in the US sometimes and health system, and so you'll see that that's one dot star, which means it has to always be there, and you can have many. Um, we have extensions, and so in the FHIR base model, sometimes uh, you have things that weren't part of FHIR International, and so we have to add our own. So in the US market, we capture race and ethnicity. That's not an international norm to do, and so we had to add a FHIR extension. Um, but we built that extension in a way that can be used across kind of all US products, and so there's a standard set of terminology there and a standard structure uh, to go with it. Um, and then also, we mentioned uh, terminology, and so right here, there's a binding to a value set gender identity. Um, I've called this one out because this is a shared value set across the, pro the, the family of products. So you're starting to hear this theme from me, hopefully, that like we're doing our best at the terminology level to share things across the different kind of exchange paradigms, whether it's a document, whether it's a Fire API, or whether it's a version two transaction. It's kind of this, like we're in this theme of like, it's time to stop kind of managing your own terminologies here. And now that we have some tooling to support it to try to use common uh, uh, value sets to go with it. Okay, so then on each page, uh, we go through great pain to create this of like these mandatory must support elements. Uh, so must have means it's got to be there every time, and then identify your name and gender. Must support is you got to at least support it. We did add this kind of funky, uh, I don't know if I used the word funky. Um, we did add this thing called additional USCDI requirements. And if you're first reading the spec for the first time, you may scratch your head a little bit at this, um, and, and that's okay. Um, I'm going to actually show you the page so you can see it. We have, in, we have a requirement in HL7, if you are developing a US-based specification, you have to build on US core, okay? Full stop. And when we kind of instituted that rule, we ran into cases where for public health, they said, you know what? Um, we actually can't accept date of death, or we can't accept uh, the previous address, okay? And so we had flagged those as requirements because those were policy requirements. and so. We scratched our head a little bit about like, do we invent this thing called a base standard, where it's just, like really loosely constrained, ever could build on, and a core, and anyway, there's a whole song and dance about modeling. And we said, you know what? We're just gonna start by putting little notes to say, these are additional USCDI requirements. If you're a certified health IT system, here's an additional set of things you have to do. So anyone in the room thinking about certification, you have to do the must have, must support, and the additional USCDI requirements. By making them additional USCDI requirements, it supported better reuse within kind of the IG development ecosystem of um, public health could then build and know they're only going to have to support these like five things. And these others are nice to know that they, they could support them, but they're not a hard requirement for their IG. Um, and we did also flex a little bit to say like you can you know, if you absolutely cannot build on US core, you know, like, you know further constrain it. 
or, or you can come to, there's a work group at Agile 7, you can ask for a formal variance request, which has happened here and there because uh, you know, they're not able to do uh, what, what, what was requested in the specification. Um, okay, so each thing has this narrative guidance. We have profile uh, specific implementation guidance. Folks, if you, uh, I, I know reading standards may be dry, but man, we spend a lot of time on some of this language. Um, and so like date of death, okay? It's a really simple element, date of death, right? That's what ONC said. You go into spec here and you read deceased, okay? So you'll see, all right, there's not a must support here. There's a US CDI. And someone said to us like, do I have to do Boolean and date of death? It's not clear. Like, what, like, what do I actually have to do? Um, and this is, this is big dollars for folks, right? Because they're having to build their systems to support both their customers and prepare for certification. And so we added a sentence that said, oh, date of, date of death, deceased date time. And I think hopefully there's a quick link. Uh, shoot, the versions here. Let me show you how I was directory published versions here. I'm going to show you. So in 7. I'm going, sorry, this page is the history page. Every single spec in Fire, US Core across, has this nice yellow box, and you can see this directory published versions. And if you clicked on that directory published versions, you'll see all the, all the current, prior, where it's headed. And so what I'm going to do is go to US Core 7 for a moment with you. And in US Core 7, you will see, I'm go to patient. Yeah, I'm calling this out because it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's like a little bit of pain. Um, but someone had said, hey, that sentence that you added wasn't clear enough for me. Um, oops, where did it go here? So you'll see this sentence here. This sentence about date of death wasn't clear enough for me. Um, can you please expand it? And so it expanded to like, hey, it's used during this. Although this is marked as this, you shall support at least this, all right? So I know it's just a nuanced thing, but like we, I would say, after you read the must and the USC, the must support, um, please take a moment to read the additional guidance. It may save you some time uh, as you go to do implementation. Okay, and then another item on every profile page, and this is again, this is not something that may be common in every core, but we found core around the world, but in US core, we found is really helpful for folks. Oh, I'm going to go back to six one zero. Is we've at the bottom added the mandatory searches. Um, so if you're a client app developer and you're trying to figure out like what can I expect, getting by logical ID is something everybody's going to support. Um, uh, searching by patient identifier, so their medical record number or other special identifier that a site may have. Searching by name, uh, searching by birth date and time. Um, these are things that certified systems have to go through and prove they can do. We do add some shoulds at, underneath here, uh, and that's just a simple like direction setting that many servers already support and we may require uh, in the future. If you do peek ahead to 7.0, we this is where this kind of granular, we did add scopes in here, um, and so you'll see if you were to look at observation, you would see like observation scopes for categories of health concerns and um, encounter diagnosis. Okay, so that is the quick start page. Uh, that's the full view of a profile. Um, okay, so inside the spec, if you were to click, so this is why I mentioned that uh, problem value set. Um, if you were to click on that condition code, it would take you to uh, a value set definition, and this is a particular, it's a compositional value set. We're including codes from a specific hierarchy in SNOMED and including codes from ICD. So this is a very large value set. Um, sometimes we have these things called enumerative code sets. Someone, Picking pregnancy is a very small. I know there can be lots of nuances and more complexity to pregnancy, but we just have these like three values of pregnant, not pregnant, possibly pregnant, uh, and then uh, in unknown, where we've actually specifically included the values in the spec. All right, capability statements. Um, these are a big deal, and this is a requirement of every Fire server, regardless of uh, it's not specific to US Core. You have to expose the capabilities your server provides. Um, we provide an example US Core capability statement in the spec, but again, every Fire server has to provide their own. Um, and so inside the capability statement, you'll see the expectations that server must uh, support, um, or sorry, they're claiming what they support. And so in the example, um, we have kind of the list of support profiles. 
uh, the supported searches that go with it and combinations. This is something that has evolved over time. And I would say, you know, we are very fortunate in that as we develop the spec, we have folks who are developing testing tools alongside us. And so they're giving us feedback to say, hey, this wasn't very clear in your capability statement. I didn't know how to interpret that to then test the fire server. So for anyone who's doing development in your own country, it's very important to be communicating with who's doing that testing platform, or if you're doing software development in your own product, to make sure you're building your capability statement to actually match the capabilities uh, you're building. Um, and that validation tooling we have in the US market, uh, uh, one of them is Inferno. There's another one, Touchstone Aegis, uh, that folks can use uh, for certification. Um, and this not only does US core API testing, there's a bulk capability, a smart capability, there's a whole other set of functionality available here. Um, testing and community feedback. Uh, we do do testing at the Age 7 Connectathon, so if you're uh, available in September in Atlanta, we will have a weekend session where we'll work with Inferno to test. Uh, feedback and testing is what makes specs good and implementable. It's, you really can't get enough feedback. Um, you always learn little nuances of how someone interpreted what you wrote, um, and so this is a very critical point of the development cycle. Okay, so this is a screenshot. I did, I did highlight, there are two things I didn't highlight earlier, but I wanna highlight here, is ONC leaves these little like breadcrumbs that I love, okay? And I try to tell them I love them and thank them, is that like, hey, we added 20 elements in this cycle. Um, and you know, on this page, I don't think this is very obvious, but for me, this is the first thing I read, oops, I lost, okay. This is the first thing I look at every single time is on here, there's this thing called a standards bulletin, okay? It's, I, I, I call it almost hidden, but it's not hidden, it's, it's clearly there. Um, but the standards bulletin, put this in your head. Inside this, this is where ONC actually writes the differential between the versions, okay? So if you're trying to understand like what's next, this is the thing to look at. And they do a description of why, there's more detail why, and we always, the first thing we all do, Eric or I do, is we take a screenshot of this, throw it on the H7 Confluence page, and be like, hey folks, this is what we're building from. So um, anyway, Sanders Bolton, my, my, one of my favorite things. Um, okay, uh, and then the levels. Oh man, this is a big gnarly slide, but I, I couldn't help but put this in at the end. Um, so I, Steve Posnack and I, uh, at Agile 7, uh, we have a US Rome steering committee and we chair it and we went back and forth on this, this visual. And the reason I wanted to include it is I wanted to make it very clear where the US market is headed for the versions of Fire. So the rows, so you see on the, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right here, but if you go way over, you see there's three rows. So we have R4, R5, and R6. And underneath R4 in the columns, you'll see in 2020, it was when 311 was released, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. So we're marching across the top row right now for Fire release four with new releases on an annual basis. And underneath there, you'll see kind of the US CDI release that corresponds uh, to that release, okay? Because that release is the kind of the prior year. And the reason I want to call this out, there are kind of two things. One, to mention the kind of rulemaking piece on the bottom. You'll see that the HGI-1 rule was published in there, 23, and comes into effect, that blue arrow. Uh, so it was published over here. It comes into effect January 1. That's why we're going to have to do 6.1.0. So that's kind of the, the blue. There's some rumblings of an HGI2 out there from ONC. We know it's, anyway, we'll, someday we'll get to read it. It's not out yet. Um, but the point, the, the, so the first thing is like, we're committed to R4. You can see that. We've been marching along for years and years. And the, the question was, what are we doing about R5? And we have decided to say, you know, we're viewing R5 as a kind of a, a international maintenance release, and we're not planning to do a US core on R5. So the US market, is planning to skip from R4 to R6 when it's available. And how we're gonna skip, I don't know. I mean, we have right now, we, ha we have this like overlap right now, so I can pretend, like it's nice to pretend in 2026 we're gonna do two releases at once, but I, it'll be interesting, because I think there's gonna be a lot of transition, you know, people talk about transition work between like different versions of US Core being a challenge. This is gonna be a bigger challenge for us. Uh, and so we're talking about maybe doing two specs in parallel, um, but as US, or sorry, as Fire R6 becomes more clear, we'll have to kind of get serious about exactly how we're gonna do this. But it, I'm hopeful ONC will be like, you know, we're gonna give you a break from US CDI that year, 
hint, hint, um, so that you can like figure this out. Um, but anyway, this is what it's looking like. This is what we've adopted. This is what we're, com we're committed to this plan of not doing a R5 release. We didn't make this statement about, just if, if you were look back to the past for a moment, we did not make the statement about uh, Fire STU3. And some vendors implemented STU3. So there is STU3 in the market, but it's not consistent across US vendors. Some did it, some didn't. Some were like, why did we do this? Um, and anyway, we want to make it very clear that we're not going to do a US core on R5. OK, future of um, US core. We joke that it's the way too early designs because we're designing on something that ONC hasn't finished. Um, but if you were to cop this link, we have spent probably, I don't know, 80 hours already trying to think about how this would look. And there's actually new formal profiles uh, to support that. And that's on the HL7 Confluence page. Um, so I guess the way I think of it now is like the US CDI frog is ready to hop. And uh, we're going to chop uh, not too far behind it. Um, but to wrap up, how to participate, uh, we are currently, uh, I don't want to say we're in a hold. We, we did a lot of design at the HL7 May work group meeting. Um, you can comment on the Confluence page or any designs, but we've decided that our next design, unless we get a ton of feedback offline, our next design session will be within one week of ONC publishing US CDI. So if they publish it July 4th, we'll kick off the next week. Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll just stay tuned to the Argonaut uh, Zulip channel. Uh, and that's where we'll make sure the information is posted. Or you can contact you know, Gino, Dan, myself, and Josh are here. Or Eric's always on, uh, available on Zulip. Um, so anyway, hope what you learned is US CDI data policy is enabled by US Core. Uh, you understand that it's widely used. We have lots of versions. You'll be able to navigate the SEC and then find the future work. Um, we're doing feedback for this dev day. So please, for all your talks, uh, take a moment to give feedback. And, uh, I look forward to all of you commenting on US Core, all right? So if we get one comment from all of you, it'll be just this much better. And so, yeah. And not just US Core. Comment on all the fire specs, because I've said it over, I'll say it again. They're only as good as the feedback and testing is done on them. So thank you very much. And I'll pause to see if anybody has any questions on US Core. No. You got a mic. My question has to do with your vocabulary bindings. Um, what has been US Core's com um, conversation around including the null flavors in those bindings for those of us who get a bunch of junk data and we need to, like a condition, we might get a Acme Lab condition code, diagnosis code, and including those null flavors? Yeah, I mean, it's a... Um, it's a real challenge. I mean, we have added, uh, I think we were in the prior HL7 standards, we were kind of open to say, pick any null flavor you wanted. And so for better or worse, we've tightened it up to say, like, there's only a couple you may use. Um, but uh, I'm hoping better validation will pick up to validate that type of stuff. But we do still have some null flavors allowed. Oh. If you have null flavors that we, we've, we've definitely added more null flavors back. If you have null flavors that you think we're missing in a few spots, please submit them and we'll consider them because we have tried to add, we definitely add, we originally didn't add any. And so, Basically, that was my question. yeah, yeah. Basically, that was my question is whether or not if I log those trackers and yeah. say, please add null flavors here, 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 and here if you would even consider it. And we you're will, saying, yeah, we okay. will consider it now. Before, it was probably a much harder no. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. And I, I question. Thank you for the presentation. I'm doing the, the same kind of work for France. I'm editing the FR core implementation guide. So I have uh, two kind of question. So uh, the first one is, uh, what are you using to edit the structure definition, structure definition files? Because I see that they are directly on uh, on GitHub, so you are not using Fish. And the second question is about USCDI. There are no technical, uh, like a way to um, to modelize the the data model in USCDI. Is that a kind of mapping using concept maps of something like that between USCDI and US Core? And uh, 
the final point is that we made the same decision as you and not implement F5 for FACOR and directly go to F6. Yeah. So sorry, the first question is about how are we building the IG? Yep. Oh, are you building the structured definition files? Uh, so you are not using fish? We so are. So we, we've slowly been migrating more and more to fish and sushi to build the guide. Like originally we were spreadsheets and, you know, custom editing the structure. So for folks who there's, I think Simone just left, but she's doing a class on how to build IGs using fish and sushi. And we are s slowly using bits and pieces of more and more of that because it provides a great, I think if we started today, that's where we would start from. Okay. It just didn't exist, and so we're kind of having to back into it. Um, in terms of like the mapping to USCDI, it is interesting for us in that we, there's not a, you know, ONC, I'm, I want to be careful how I phrase this, like they're not providing USCDI in any kind of machine processable way, it's yeah. just a PDF. And I, oops, and I'm okay with that. I think that's an acceptable way to do it. Um, but um, yeah, so there's, but we do include a mapping table, which is what I'm showing here in the spec, directly of every single ONC. Uh, yeah, the blue array, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And then there's one more question here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And did I, did you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you consider using the structure definitions mapping ability and why did you skip it? <laughs> for, for, for to map the USCDI elements. Um, I don't think we, it's funny you say that, because I feel like we've, I, I remember having a conversation about a while back, and I just don't think we've revisited it recently. But yeah, it'd be easy, it'd be straightforward to add that, right? Okay. And yeah. so, yeah, that's something we should consider. Thanks. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh. <laughs> Make a note to myself. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I want to come back to terminology again. And <laughs> what you were saying earlier on about using VSAC value sets, I'm interested in what agreements you have with the NLM to ensure that, in particular for required and extensible bindings, that they don't change those value sets in a way that makes your models no longer correct. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, I feel like it, it's, a, it's, it's a loaded question, Ruben. Uh, um, so, I mean, VSAC has been willing to make releases for us where they make a cut when we publish the spec. And so what I mean is like what Ruben's alluding to is like terminology is always changing, new things are added, new things are retired, and like that could influence, you know, if you're referencing this external thing. Um, I have to say, I mean, most recently we had some, a re we have to do a better job in terms of like cutting this is the side terminology for the release. And I think with that being, as we point to NLM, I think the relationship there, it's a long relationship that um, we don't maybe have as tight of control as we may like, um, but it, it, is, it is what it is um, right now. Um, so I'd be happy, to, Ruben, to talk with you and Dan Riemann, their chief data standards, to, to, to tighten that up even more. Um, or look at UTG, the kind of HL7 infrastructure to support that better. But yeah, it's a great ongoing question. Happy to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So we're all aware that there is a big deadline coming up with US CDI v3 and correspondingly uh, US Core 6. Uh, what adoption are you seeing for versions that don't have the force of regulation behind them? Yeah. It's a great question. I think I'm going to answer it in two parts, okay? So the first part is like within the HL7 IG development community. It's so like the DaVinci guy, there's, you know, there's the DaVinci accelerator, the Karen accelerator. As those folks develop implementation guides, they're very nervous about grabbing new versions of US Core. So they tend to want to build on 3.1.1. Um, so that's kind of the HL7 ecosystem. But when you talk to the vendors, um, they don't necessarily, my experience, you know, as the Argonaut community, I get to talk to, you know, half a dozen of the biggest EHRs in the market, and they're looking ahead, and they're not, like, constrained by what's in the U.S. Core 311, and so they're always folding new features way beyond U.S. Core, and they're always, like, the feedback of, hey, you did five, like, they're, they're actively, 
They may not declare that they're supporting US Core 5, but they've already folded those features in to their API because they're trying to prepare for the next release. And so it's not like, you know, Oracle and Epic and Meditech are jumping from 301 to 6. They've already added like 60% or 70% of those features because their client customers' apps have asked for them. And so it's like kind of a natural growth path that they may not be publicly announcing the way you may like, but they are adding it to their API. All right, that's a wrap. Go get some coffee.